Hi everyone, it's Ash here from Move Nourish Believe and today I'm lucky enough to chat all things MMB with a totally inspirational nutritional biochemist, Dr. Libby Weaver. Uh, Libby has kindly given up her time to offer you all a little bit of guidance on the hot topics in the health and wellness space and I'm personally super excited because I heard Libby talk at her conference and I was blown away so you're going to learn a whole lot in this 30 minute space. So hi Libby, welcome to Move Nourish Believe. Thank you Ashley, hi everyone, I'm very chuffed to Hello, be here. Libby. <laughs> <laughs> oh, super excited, this is our first Google Hangout so there might be a bit of delays everyone so bear with us. Um, today we're going to talk about the questions you submitted to us on the blog post. So we're going to really break them down. So we're going to talk first about craving sugar, uh, why we do it, even though we know it doesn't serve our health. We're going to talk the factors that tell the body to burn fat or store fat. I'm sure everyone wants to know about that. And finally, we're going to talk about uh, how to make sense of conflicting nutritional information out there because there's a whole lot so we're going to really break that down. So Libby, let's start talking about the S word. Let's start talking about craving sugar and why we do it. Yeah, let's get into that. It's, it's something I'm asked about all the time because there's so many people, they're fantastic at making great choices for breakfast and lunch these days and then it's in the middle of the uh, afternoon where people feel like someone else takes their body over and even really good intentions can just go out the window. So the first, we've got to take a step back because I want to help people understand that it's not always about the food, that there can be factors going on behind the scenes that lead us into choosing food that doesn't serve our health. So in this case, especially um, food that's really high in, pro in refined sugars. So our body is designed to be able to burn two different fuels, either glucose, which I could call sugar, but I'm going to use the proper word, which is glucose, or fat, or a combination of both. And it's actually your nervous system that is one of the big driving factors in which fuel your body is going to use. And your nervous system is your brain and your spinal cord and all the nerves that come off that and support the function of all of your organs and it is always picking up on information in the environment. So if you can imagine that there are things that you can control obviously, like you could do some squats, you could kick your legs, you can wave your arms around, you choose the clothes to dress yourself with, that's one Hard. That's your conscious mind making those decisions, but your subconscious mind makes the decision to control things you can't access with your thoughts, like how quickly your heart beats, how quickly your hair grows, how quickly your fingernails grow. If you heal a cut, you don't have to stand there and talk to it to make it heal. Your body has a has a wisdom and, and the resources to do that, which every time I say that out loud, it blows my head off my shoulders. It's really, really miraculous that all of that just gets taken care of. So. And that's, that's the part of your nervous system called the autonomic nervous system. You don't need to worry about all the silly words, but you'll understand why this is important in two seconds. So then within the autonomic nervous system, the part you cannot get into with your conscious thinking mind, there are two branches. There's the fight or flight response, which in scientific terms is the sympathetic nervous system. When that gets activated, you're in the fight or flight response. I also call that the red zone. That's adrenaline, one of our stress hormones that drives that. And when you've got high circulating levels of adrenaline, historically, that communicated to every cell in your body that your life was literally in danger. And because your body doesn't understand that it's uh, 2014 and that you might be making lots of adrenaline in your body because you're regularly over-consuming caffeine, for example, because caffeine leads the human body to make adrenaline. And so it's the, you've got to hear me, it's the regular over-consumption of it. Um, which is a different amount for everyone. And then the other thing that will lead people to make adrenaline today is their perception of pressure. And the reason that I put the word perception in front of the word pressure, that's because it is, even though we might not realize it. Because for a lot of people today, they have very busy lives, but they're very rich and full and full of opportunities and 
they're essentially very privileged lives because really all of our basic needs are met. But and so if I give you an example from the past, I've been seeing patients for 16 years now and when I used to say to people, where's the stress and pressure in your life, they'd say, someone I love is very unwell. But now when I ask people, they say, well, I had a week's holiday and now I've got 600 new emails and I don't know when I'm going to get the chance to deal with them. <laughs> and that's busy. That's not pressure. You choose to see that as pressure. It's just that, 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 That's just busy. And it also you've got to recognize, take another step back from that, you worry about your emails because you've got a beautiful heart. You worry about your emails because you care. Because if you didn't care about, your, you, you don't want to let people down. You want to be efficient. You want to make sure people feel loved and, and cared for. So you want to make sure you're getting back to them. So it comes from a beautiful place. But we compile so many things up today to create a meaning of pressure. And so whether whatever it is that's leading you to make a lot of adrenaline, because your body thinks your life's in danger, it has to power you to get out of that danger. Because historically, that's exactly what had to happen. And it need, your body needs a fuel to give you the energy to power you to get out of there. And it's going to make a decision between glucose and fat. And take a, So take a wild guess which fuel your body is, which fuel is your fast burning fuel for your body between glucose and fat. It's going to be your glucose every time. Glucose is fast, fast to burn, not our fat. So when we're always living on adrenaline, we use the glucose that is first of all in our blood, but we also store glucose in our body. We store it in, in our muscles and in our liver. It's called glycogen. And so if, you, if you're starting to get a bit low on your blood glucose, your body will release the stored glycogen and convert it back into glucose to supply you with the fuel to get you out of danger. But you're not in danger. You might be sitting at your desk going, oh my goodness, I've just got three new deadlines that I wasn't expecting today. You've made a heap of adrenaline. Your body then releases a whole lot of stored glucose, but you're just sitting at your desk. You're not mobilizing it. Because if you think historically when we had all that adrenaline, we would escape from the danger or fight the fight. So we were moving. So when we move, we're able to utilize some of that adrenaline. But again, it's another key reason why movement is so important is because we're going to be able to utilize that. So when... Uh, I'll tell you another story just to really bring this message home. Sure. Which involves the other part of the nervous system. So the red, the red zone, the fight or flight, the sympathetic nervous system, that's that. You always use our glucose as fuel area. But when we activate the other part of the nervous system, the parasympathetic nervous system, which is where we rest, it's where digestion is optimal, it's where all the repair mechanisms in the body go to work, it's really critical for reproduction. It's what I call the green zone. We burn our body fat very readily when we are in the green zone because your body feels safe. Now, what leads us to be able to activate that part of our nervous system to communicate to our body that it's safe? This sounds crazy, but I w it would take me about three hours to explain the science, which we don't have right now, so I'll just give you the <laughs> top-level piece of information. It's actually the length of your exhalation is what will act the longer your exhalation with a lovely long exhalation you will activate your parasympathetic nervous system the calm arm so a really healthy person swings between the green zone and the red zone there's no problem about going into the red zone you just don't want to live there and then when you've finished whatever you're doing in the red zone you want to come out of it and you want to mostly live from that green zone so someone with a very balanced nervous system is able to utilize fat and glucose as a fuel and that is very healthy. This next part of this and where this relates to uh, sugar cravings is because glucose is your get out of danger fuel, your body wants to make sure that your sugar reserves, your glucose reserves stay nice and full in case there is some danger. So if someone weighs 70 kilos that person will store about 2,500 calories of glucose in their body as glycogen. That's the fuel reserve for that, about 2,500 calories for someone who weighs about 70 kilos. But for that same person, they will store about 130,000 calories of fat, which is why we can survive for quite a while without food. Not that I'm suggesting that for a <laughs> second, but just to, just to explain that, we've got great reserves there. So uh, when your but when your sugar reserve gets below about three quarters full, your body's desire for it gets switched on 
because it needs you to top up that sugar reserve. And if you are, if you don't have gr nourishing things on hand, that's when you can tend to go for the quick fix. That's when you where you can tend to go for something that doesn't serve your health. So we've got to make sure we're we're making sure that we don't live constantly in the red zone because if you just if you keep doing that if you keep living on adrenaline and living at such a, at a, such a fast and frantic pace your body's going to get the message that it always needs to use its glucose we want to be able to use both fuel sources so that doing incorporating more restorative practices more breath focused practices into your life if you are someone who is really go 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 you've got to bring some balance into that i always say with movement whatever you resist is usually what you need. <laughs> so for people who <laughs> really love high intensity stuff, they tend to live their lives with high intensity and so we've got to balance balance our nervous system out with some restorative practices and people who just want to chill all the time, they need a bit of go-go back in them. So it's, it's always that balance. So that's the first place to start with our sugar cravings. The next step in making a difference there is also with our taste buds, they are actually brand new every 21 days. So if you can imagine your body is made up of 50 trillion cells, about that much, which is a crazy big number. And if you, I'll give you an example of how big that is. 32,000, sorry, 1 trillion seconds ago was 32,000 years ago. And we've only had a calendar for 2014 years. So <laughs> that's 1 trillion. Like it's just such a, it's an extraordinary extraordinary large number so we've got about 50 trillion cells in our body and they always want to talk to each other and they need nutrients to do that and the, the, the nutrients that are present in our blood will also help the quality of the cells when they die and replace themselves because we are all brand new about every 10 years our bones are the slowest to replace themselves but so um, our skin, the outer layer of our skin is all brand new every 28 days, which is why we can make a big impact on that when we step up and take even better care of our health uh, for such a short period of time. And it's the same for our taste buds. They're all brand new about every 21 days. And the more bitter wow. food we include in our diet, the less desire we have for sweet food. Now, what has a bitter taste base these days? And it's essentially our green leafy veggies. So the more green leaves you bring into your world on a daily basis, your desire for sweet food will start to fall away. Now you can do that with green smoothies, with more stir fries, with more soups, casseroles, whatever it is, bringing more green food in. I travel a lot and sometimes I can take my high speed blender, sometimes I can take my juicer but not always, it depends how I'm travelling. And so when I'm on the road a lot, I will always take with me a green powder that I can just mix with water just to keep that grain going. And the more bitter you bring in, the, le the less your desire for sugar. A patient taught me that. She was a she, This is her description of herself. She wrote to me to, to tell me all of this after her experience. She was very overweight and she said to me, I'm no good at eating less of anything. <laughs> so she said, but mm -hmm. I loved the idea of eating more. And she said, and you bark on and on about eating more green plants. And so I thought, okay, I'm going to focus just on eating more green vegetables. And she said, and I did. And within about three weeks, she said, my desire for sugar just went through the floor. And she said, and so it didn't even feel like an effort. I didn't even feel like I was concentrating on going without she said it was it felt effortless so that can be a really lovely transition for some people it is a decision for some people it this is sort of my third strategy for some people it is just I'm gonna decide to not do that I I know that I'm precious I know that without my health I have nothing I'm as when it comes to food I am just gonna raise my standards from this point forward and that refined sugar that doesn't do any good for my health just doesn't belong in my body anymore. That's the third strategy. You can you can just make that decision. But the reason I wanted to give you the other two first, so bringing more calm in and amping up the green plant content, is because for a lot of people they've tried to make those decisions and it hasn't stuck. <laughs> but I do know that there are people out there that are that that do make those decisions and that's all they need. So there's three strategies to really decrease the, your desire for those sweet foods. And the, probably the final thing I'd say on that topic is there's nothing wrong with having something that's sweet in its flavour. And so, for example, if you want to choose uh, food the way it comes in nature, 
that is naturally sweet, then I have no problem with that unless it's a really, really bad habit that you're trying to break. So if you're someone, for me, because we've got, we've eaten fruit for a very, as a human race, we've eaten fruit for a very long time. One of the big problems, though, is that people were massively starting to overconsume it. So the current recommendations say that two pieces a day is all we need. And I was meeting people that were eating five or 12 pieces of fruit a day, and it's just too much fructose. So there are people who definitely do better without fructose in their diet because it ferments in their digestive system. And so for those people, zero fruit can be a great way forward. Or they might notice that if they poke, cook the fruit, it, has, uh, it doesn't have that same effect. Or they might notice that if they have fruit first thing on an empty stomach, that it doesn't then end up bloating them. So everybody's different with that. But for a lot of people, two pieces of fruit a day is, uh, is no problem. Um, but again, it's highly individual and I would, um, I would really only guide people with that on an individual basis. But sweetening some fruit, uh, sorry, sweetening your food with healthy sweeteners that contain vitamins and minerals because it's vitamins and minerals that keep us alive. So maple syrup, for example, contains magnesium, manganese, some calcium, small amounts, but at least you get some bang for your buck. And you don't need very much at all added to food to give it just that hint of sweetness if, if that's what you're looking for. So using those natural sweeteners can also be a wonderful way to satisfy that desire for sweet food while still serving your health. So it's, yeah, but that's, that's it, it can be quite individual depending on where you're at. I always try and meet people where they are and advise them from that point forward. And it's, it's, um, it's tricky because everybody out there will be starting from a different point. So there's the sugar sure. story. <laughs> And um, with the fruit thing, um, is there some fruits you suggest to your clients that are, you know, a little bit more forgiving on the body, or are you sort of, you know, embrace all fruits and all their glory? Yeah, I so berries are it, again. It's so it's it's so individual because there are more and more people out yeah. there who whose tummies aren't able to break the fructose down as effectively as probably even twenty years ago, and uh, stress is playing a big role in that. Our gut bacteria is playing a big role in that. It's it's sort of a story for another day. But to answer the question, berries uh, can be a great choice for a lot of people because they're really rich in antioxidants. They've got a lovely vitamin C content, and they tend to have a fairly a, a lower sugar content. I love lemons, even though this I know they're not sweet. Mm. They're sour, but they're just so <laughs> divine. I love. I eat them. Just eat them, <laughs> and I love the juice. They're great in desserts too. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, I love pineapple. Is probably, yes, <laughs> pineapple <laughs> is probably my personal favorite fruit. One of the reasons I love that I love the taste of it, but. It also contains digestive enzymes, and uh, that can be a really great help for so many women today. So, um, pineapple, and of course, mangoes. It's the time of year, certainly in the southern hemisphere, for mangoes right now. So, and passion fruit. We grew them on a vine in my backyard when I was growing up. So, uh, they're all really lovely choices. They've all just got so much vitamin C in them, which is so important for huge numbers of processes in in our body, including the body's ability to make and prevent the breakdown of collagen. So it does, and great for our immune system, does so much good stuff. So but if, if I had to pick one fruit that is my absolute favorite, it's pineapple because it does so much for our digestive system as well. Awesome. So all, all up to the individual and you've given some great tips on how to kick sugar and what it all means. So I guess now we want to talk about the factors that tell the body to burn fat or store fat. Now I know in the blog post we had quite a few questions about uh, readers storing fat around their lower belly, however even if they eat really well or still keep up a really great exercise regime. So yeah, what are your thoughts on that and um, how does the body kind of turn things into fat or store fat? What are the factors there? So it's I was at uni. I'll just give you a bit of background to build into this because the the background will really help sure. this make sense for people. I was at university for 14 years, which I know makes me sound really thick uh, when I say that out loud, but <laughs> I loved learning and still do. And while I was doing 
my PhD in biochemistry, I had all of the biochemical pathways of the body mapped out on my on my bedroom walls. And when you see the body like that, you can see the critical role that nutrients play in the conversion of substance X inside you into substance Y and it might be zinc that's necessary for that and if we don't have enough zinc in our diet maybe substance X accumulates and then you don't get enough substance Y and that might impact on someone's happiness or their ability to sleep properly or their ability to burn body fat so when we are healthy we lose weight whereas most people see it the other way around most people think they have to lose weight to be healthy but you've actually got to be really healthy to lose weight so that's the first thing is to focus, for me, it's about focusing on getting the nutrients in. It's a focus on health. It's not a focus on weight. And then while I was at university, I was a mad cane runner and I'd run for about two hours, six or seven days a week. And then I got a job running a health retreat and uh, I couldn't run anymore because I had to leave home at 20 past four in the morning to get to work by 5.30 to wake the guests up and then by 6 o'clock in the morning we were doing Tai Chi which is very gentle and you essentially just move your arms very gently and breathe diaphragmatically uh, for half an hour and then my next job in the day was to take the guests on the on what was called an easy walk, 20 minutes flat ground, I didn't break a sweat doing that and, um, so, and my eating remained the same so I went from being little miss um, girl, a girl burning bucket loads of calories as a runner to little Miss Tai Chi not burning very many calories at all doing that and my eating remained the same but my clothes got looser and it fried my brain because the opposite should have happened if it was just the calorie equation that held true and another woman that springs to mind is a lady came to see me after she'd done the New York Marathon so she'd train, she's, she'd run between wow. 40 and 90 miles a week for nine months, eaten amazingly, and she'd gained 12 kilos. When, again, if the calorie equation was the only thing that influenced body shape and size, she would have been a stick monster. So it was, it was, what I, was, it was my own experience with my clothes getting looser when I changed my movement patterns. It was that coupled with what I was noticing in not all definitely not all, but more and more of particularly my female clients that led me to go back to my geeky biochemistry textbooks with the question in my head, what leads the human body to get the message that it needs to burn fat and what leads it to get the message that it needs to store fat. And so what I came up with, I, put, I ended up writing my first book about it, Accidentally Overweight, and there are nine factors. And essentially I already explained part of it to you with the nervous system about the message that your body gets about which fuel to use. But more importantly, there are other factors like our stress hormones. So cortisol is our long-term stress hormone. And it has a, we only ever made cortisol historically uh, when there was long-term stress, which in the past were floods and famines and wars. And if you think about all of those scenarios, food was scarce. And in modern times, when we have our long-term worries, it might be about relationships or about finances or the well-being of someone we love, or for a lot of women, their first waking thought in the morning is, what will I or won't I eat today? How much exercise can I get done today? Oh my goodness, it's six o'clock already and I haven't even been to the gym yet and I was really wanting to wear this red dress to this event that I'm going to in a couple of weeks but if I go to the gym now, there's no food at home and then I'll finish at the gym and then I've got to go to the supermarket. If I go to the supermarket, then by the time I get home and cut it all up and cook it, it'll be half past nine before I clean up and I know I've got to get up tomorrow morning and wash my hair and it just goes on and on and we get ourselves into this absolute stressed out pickle about <laughs> what we're eating that is and so true yeah and that leads us to make even more of this stress hormone and cortisol historically because it had to get us through tough times and lean times it slows our metabolism down it actually breaks our muscles down which slows our, our metabolism and that's because historically if you were a stick monster and there was no food in the world, then you have more chance of not surviving the famine. But if you've got more flesh on you, you're probably going to get through the famine better than other people. So it has cortisol has really good intentions. <laughs> but in modern times, for, for all of us, we're very blessed and food is abundant. So it, it's a very confusing message for your body. So when we're churning out cortisol because of long-term chronic stress, your body thinks there's no food left in the world, and so it slows your metabolism down. And so for most people, when their clothes get tighter, they think, well, I better go on a diet. And then when they go on a diet, they eat less. And that confirms to their body what it perceives as true, which is that there's no food left in the world. And so it's a, a really vicious cycle. 
So going on a diet is never the answer. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a change in the way you value yourself. It's a change in, in so many things. Again, a story for another another day. So cortisol has a very mm -hmm. distinct fat deposition pattern. We lay fat down around our middle, we grow bingo wings on the back of our arms and we grow what I lovingly call a back veranda. So we get back fat. And the reason <laughs> that cortisol does that is because all of our organs that keep us alive, except for our brain, they're all housed inside our torso. So cortisol wants to thicken us mm -hmm. up through our middle to keep them warm and safe and provide them with nutrients to get them through this supposed famine. So for a lot of people today when they've got belly fat that won't move, it really is a focus on their adrenal health. So the adrenal glands are where we make our stress hormones from. They sit just on top of our kidneys and we can do that physically with dietary change. We can do that using uh, great quality herbal medicine. There are certain nutrients the adrenal glands like. But it also requires a change in perspective. It's very much the believe part of Move, Nourish, Believe when we're trying to work with cortisol as well because the belief, the, a lot of the, some of the beliefs and perceptions need to change. My gorgeous mum gave me the serenity prayer when I, was a, when I was a little girl about accepting the things we doing everything we can to change the things we can but accepting the things we can't change. And there's a whole slice of heaven in acceptance. Now that doesn't mean that you have to put up with things the way they are forever. It just means that fighting with what is right now is getting you nowhere. So it's not about not going after what you want or a, you're changing your world. You change what you can, absolutely. But sometimes there's things that just have to be the, the way they are right now and, and making peace with that sometimes is just sometimes the biggest gift you can give yourself, which is I know really easy for me to say but yeah, really beginning to explore perceptions is key. So cortisol is another factor. There are nine factors that I identified and I'll, I'll rattle through them because we want to get onto the, the last question. Um, so we've got our well, calories is definitely a factor. We can't eat like little piglets and expect it all to fall into place. But I would suggest that these days, there's a lot of people who are fantastically educated in that area and if they overeat, they overeat because they feel like they start eating and they can't stop. They don't do it thinking that they're going to do themselves any favours. So for me, it's a, it's, a, it's again a belief shift that's going to need to happen there. So, But calories is definitely one part of it. Stress hormones, our sex hormones, which is another topic that we, I could talk underwater about and love talking about. I wrote a post for Move, Nourish, Believe for the blog. So if people are interested in reading more about sex hormones, you can go and check that out. Um, we've got insulin. We've got thyroid function, we've got gut bacteria, we've got alkalinity, uh, and we've got emotions. So, uh, and mm -hmm. sorry, the last one I forgot, how could I forget it, uh, is our liver function. <laughs> so that would be yeah. the other little final thing I'd say. So supporting the liver is often really critical for people to start to mobilize their body fat. So when you're not getting results from your movement and your eating, uh, just because of the world we live in right now, a lot of people do very well with, with some liver support in there. Again, the green vegetables do a great job of helping and supporting the liver uh, or you can use um, some beautiful quality uh, liver herbs if that appeals as well. So there, there's some strategies. And But I've written about that in Accidentally Overweight if you want to go into that in more detail. Okay, amazing. So there's a lot of factors we can focus on. So, you know, if we're not losing weight, we can really have a look at, you know, what the factors might be. And you know what, maybe it's just, yeah, as you said, being a little bit more easy on yourself and not going off on a 10K run when you need to lose some weight, but really focus on your breathing and what you're doing every day. So I think that's a really nice lesson from that. Hmm. Okay, so we might go off to the next question. So the next question is all about making sense of conflicting nutritional information and there is a lot out there. And probably the first one I might bring up from one of the questions in the blog post would definitely be um, the whole fat debate. So a uh, question from one of our readers states, uh, what do you think matters more? less calorie consumption or eating healthy foods. Some healthy foods such as macadamia <laughs> nuts or avocados are very high in calories but have health but have health benefits. However, some other foods are really low in calories but don't have any health benefits at all. 
So what are your views on the whole high fat situation? Yeah, our body does very well using fat as a fuel. So we want to use fat from whole food sources. So again, are you there? Can you still hear me? Yes. Yes, oh, I good. can hear you. I thought my um, love connection some technical just... difficulties. <laughs> I thought no, my connection. I just still got right. you. Um, okay, good. <laughs> um, <laughs> so the. The biggest thing is our bodies survive. We live on nutrients. Nutrients are essential for our survival. And we've actually got to eat fat to be able to burn fat. And when for a lot of people, if they're not eating enough fat, their body doesn't make the enzymes necessary to utilize fat as a fuel. And so I've worked with thousands of clients who, by increasing the whole food fat content of their diet, it's actually been the thing that's made the difference for their body's ability to use the body fat as a fuel. So for a lot of um, low calorie for a lot of low calorie foods, hello. Hello, Josh Libby. I'm back, I hope. <laughs> okay, great. I think we just lost you for a second, that's all. Same. <laughs> um, so I'm not sure how much you heard, but using uh, inc the body survives on nutrients and, and we also use um, the fat from whole foods very efficiently as, as uh, fat, as as our fuel. So um, it can be game-changing for some people to increase the food uh, the fat in their diet from whole food sources from a fat burning perspective. I've seen that change in countless people but one of the big, it changes because of the fuel preferences of the body biochemically but it can also change the desire for sweet food. Again I have found with so many people when they've been following a low calorie diet or a, a focus on Hi. Hi. <laughs> so sorry, I don't know what's going so, on. So, no, that's fine. It, it happens. It's technology these days. We can't always control it. We can't. But um, I think well, you would, no. <laughs> um, I don't know when everyone got cut off there, but um, I, you know, I, I don't quite remember what we were up to oh. where I got cut off. I'll keep. I'll just keep raving, and hopefully it'll all fall into place. But <laughs> I saw there's a couple of re when we increase uh, our the whole food fat content of our diet, it can make a difference to the body knowing that there's availability of fat in the environment. So it will you it will that number one, but also number two when we use when we eat more fat from real food, uh, we need to make enzymes to be able to break that down. And then we also require those enzymes to be able to use our body fat as a fuel. So again, that can be another great support for burning more body fat uh, as a fuel source. Uh, but the other thing that it does, and again, this is the big kicker, and I apologize I didn't bring this up in the sugar uh, conversation earlier, but 
again, what I've noticed is when I'm in, when I encourage people to bring more um, fat from whole food sources into their diet, especially at lunchtime, it can be absolutely game changing to their desire for sugar in the middle of the afternoon. So that might be right. that you're bringing you're bringing more avocado in, for example. That's a really easy thing to bring in at lunchtime. It's, it's the fat that we actually look for that's so incredibly nourishing. It stabilizes our blood glucose levels. It's really great for our brain and uh, our desire for sweet food can begin to fall away because a lot of people obviously want chocolate in the middle of the afternoon and if you only have two squares, no problem. But for a lot of people, it's every day, which is too much, or it's more than two squares. And when we think of chocolate, most people immediately think of sugar. But if you stop and think about it, it's actually fat that you get with that as well. And I believe that a, when a lot of people are actually craving more fat in their diet, so we've got to make sure that we're supplying our body with, with the fat that it needs. I remember very clearly when I changed, um, I just was really, I desired, my taste buds wanted more of it. And I knew it was, I shouldn't say my taste buds, it was my body. I knew it wasn't just my taste buds going, mm, yum, I want that. It, because it was really healthy food, but I wanted food that had a higher fat content, and it can be—it's very nourishing. It's very good for our nervous system. It's very good uh, when we have busy lives to help us feel and experience calm. But it is also absolutely fantastic uh, for us to be able to burn body fat. So my focus is very much on including fat from whole food sources, not counting calories, because it's the it's the nutrients in real food that keep us alive. And as the person who wrote the question pointed out, a lot of processed low calorie foods don't contain any nutrition. In fact, they can contain substances that might potentially take away from our health. So my focus is very much on real food. Great, and I, I love the lunchtime idea because even another question that came in was, you know, really battling that 3 p.m. energy slump. So introducing fats perhaps like avocado or, you know, healthy oils, nuts might be a good option for, you know, people who suffer from that sugar slump come 3 p.m. Yep. Exactly, and making like getting prepared on a Sunday with your food is so critical. So, um, Real Food Chef was one of my cook. Uh, Real Food Chef was one of my cookbooks, and in that was a recipe for brain balls. So, just all the different little balls you see out there. Often they're made from seeds and nuts, and uh, they might be sweetened a little bit, maybe with some dates or whatever. Whatever you're comfortable sweetening them with, if you even want to do that, you might not want to sweeten them. You can put some vanilla paste in there. You might put some cow or some carob in there but those types of balls as long as they've got that fat base can be incredibly nourishing uh, there in the middle of the afternoon you feel like you're getting something delicious but again it's that fat content that's very satiating yeah good and you know you don't feel guilty about it and it still tastes amazing so being prepared is obviously key to not falling sure. victim to the, <laughs> to the vending machine at 3 p.m. And, um, <laughs> all right, I might wrap it up. We've just got one last little bit of a topic. Um, we've got quite a few um, questions coming in about readers really suffering either from constant bloating, even when they eat well, exercise, drink water, and even just digestive issues, even when they eat clean. So, you know, what would you say to those people who are really, really suffering with stomach issues? So the first thing is that there can st even though you're choosing real food, whole food, eating amazingly, there can st there definitely can still be foods that are leading to that bloating. So um, they can be random foods that you just wouldn't pick. But I also don't want want people to become obsessed and you know because that's also no good for our health. But it's about for some people there are patterns. So you can ab you can absolutely pinpoint it that after you eat. Uh, an apple, for example, you'd notice that that always bloats you. So that's your body simply saying, right now, apples aren't your friends. You need to probably take a break from them or try some of the strategies I talked about earlier. Try them just on an empty stomach or cook them or simply omit them. But it doesn't mean forever. It might just be right now. So it's noticing the patterns if there are patterns. For other people, though, it's not food at all. They, it, it's It's fantastic that they're eating so clean and eating real food but and so it's not food at all it's what I was talking about earlier with our nervous system so if we come back to the red zone green zone picture when we are in the red zone when we're living on adrenaline 
because normally we have a fantastic blood supply to our digestive system and that supports great the fantastic breakdown of our food and maximum nutrient uptake and absorption from our food across into our blood supply. But when we are living on adrenaline, because your body thinks your life's in danger, it diverts that blood supply away from digestion to your periphery, to your arms and your legs, because that's what's going to power you to get out of danger. But you're not in danger. But now your digestion's compromised. But and so for a lot of people, they just can't, they live on adrenaline all day, every day in modern times because of the immediacy that they feel that they've got to deal with things. Everybody, so many people today feel they'll say to me, "There's not enough hours in the day." Uh, everything feels like it's urgent when if you took a step back you'll be able to see that it's not that way and so again that's where that change in perspective comes in but it's very difficult to, to get that perspective when we're wired on too much caffeine or just constantly focused on or feeling overwhelmed with pressure we've got to be able to, to, to change that perception so when we live in the green zone when we activate that parasympathetic nervous system when we're very when we do some breath focus practices or it might be that every time you stop at red traffic lights instead of checking emails or social media it's at red traffic lights that you do your diaphragmatic breathing whatever it is but breath focus movement classes are so fabulous and but I, it's not just while you're doing those movement classes that I want people breathing like this. I want people to live like that and then just access the red zone when they need to and then come back out of it. Because when we're in that calm place, when we're in that green zone, our digestion is so fantastic because it's really well supported. So I often notice that I've got to sometimes change someone's diet when they're constantly bloated. But the other part of that picture is very much getting back into that calm uh, aspect of the nervous system. The third factor, and it's, there's there's quite a few, but the third factor I'll I'll identify today. I talk a lot about this in Rushing Woman Syndrome, uh, another one of my books. But th the third factor that I want to highlight to people today is sometimes if we travel or we get a different water supply or I, 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 the example I use is barley belly. Sometimes when we travel to a country, we might get an upset tummy while we're there it resolves but then our, our digestive system is never the same again and we feel like even a drink of water bloats us. So sometimes it can be what I will broadly call a parasite that's still there. So there's a type of, it might be a bacteria or a fungus or a parasite that's in our, in our large intestine now that just isn't supposed to be there and if that's the case then it might be wise to see your GP or you could see a natural health practitioner and they will probably use antiparasitic or antimicrobial herbs, which again, I've been doing with thousands of patients over the last 16 years with usually great results. So it's about finding, getting to the heart of your matter. It's That's true for everything with our health. It's getting to the heart of, of each individual's matter to, to get the medicine in inverted commas, <laughs> whether that is the way, it's, it's about yeah looking at it from every perspective, the way we eat, drink, think, move, believe and perceive. All of those things often need to be explored with the different things that, that people are experiencing. Amazing. So I think you know, a really big part of this all is really listening to your body and you've given us so many great touch points on each topic, which has been amazing. I can't wait to review this. But um, before we wrap up, do you have any last messages you'd like to send out to our readers or anything? We've yeah. talked sugar, we've talked burning fat or nutritional information, but any last uh, words or encouragement to anyone listening out there? I th it's... The whole, co the whole move, nourish, believe concept is just, it's so important and it's, it's simple but it's so effective to, to embrace it because it's, it involves all the areas of our health because for a lot of people when they're just focused on the way they eat, so essentially the nourish part, it can become, a lot of people today get really obsessed about it and if you label yourself by the way that you eat, you can miss out on the messages your body gives you about something it might actually want you to be including. So rather than get this big idea about I only eat this way, really pay attention to your body and su supply it with the foods that, that you know nourish and energise you. So we are all individuals and it can be in this day and age with so much conflicting information out there, it can be really easy to get overwhelmed and confused but the answers are within you and what is great for your colleague or your next door neighbour or your sister might not be the 
the right thing for you. So it's 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 noticing what energizes and serves you. So really begin to tune into your body. It doesn't have a voice, but it will always give us messages to let us let us know whether it's happy or not. And it's it's then translating that. And I sometimes think that when there's a part of our body that frustrates us. It's just the body trying to communicate with us that it wants us to eat, drink, move, think, believe or perceive in a new way. And so I want to encourage people to see the parts that they feel dissatisfied with as great gifts that are going to give them even more amazing health than they have right now. Ah, so amazing. Thank you so much, Dr. Libby. I'm You're sure so I've welcome. learned a ton. <laughs> I know I have. You're so welcome. And, um, uh, and I'm very. Sorry. I love. I, no, you're fine. Sorry if there's a little delay. I love. Um, I love writing the blogs for Move, Nourish, Believe, and I have my own website, which is drlibby.com. So I want everybody to really, yeah, make the most of the incredible free information that's out there, and to educate themselves, and hopefully be inspired to, yeah, just to step up and take even, even better care of themselves because life is so precious. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, it is. Thank you so much, Dr. Libby, and I can't wait to get this on the blog so everyone can hear about every beautiful thing you've said today. And um, yeah, there's a whole archive of, Libby, of Libby's articles on Move Nourish Believe that you can access. So information is always there. And thank you all for listening. Thank Thanks you, Libby. Everyone. Thanks, everyone. I loved it. Bye. Bye. Bye.